we'll, we'll wait for you guys to say when you're ready. <laughs> okay. So, um, thank you for coming, everybody. Um, I realise upstairs I didn't actually introduce myself. I'm Caroline Wright. I'm an artist. Um, I have a studio at Wising Arts Centre just outside Cambridge. And um, My Home is My Museum is a project that um, came from an idea that I had many years ago that I've been really burning and wanting to do and has formulated and muddled around my brain and finally got the opportunity to come out as part of Curating Cambridge, which has been this amazing eight, seven weeks? Five weeks. Five weeks of wonderful events, cultural happenings, exhibitions, talks, all sorts of things across Cambridge. And this, in fact, I think is the last day of Curating Cambridge. So we feel sort of as if we're almost wrapping that project up as well as um, bringing My Home is My Museum to a sort of temporary conclusion. Um, I'd like to just thank a couple of people as well before I start, just in case I forget at the end. Um, I had an able assistant called Kirsten Lavers for this project who was wonderful in, in helping support me to go out and visit people who were donating their objects to the online collection. Some of those objects then found their way here, so thank you very much, Kirsten. And some wonderful people who also allowed me to make performances in their house, houses, and I'd like to thank them too, Pete and Kirsten. Uh, who are here. Um, I'd also like to thank somebody who is unable to be here because of a bereavement and that's a, a, a fantastic producer called Kat Harrison from Arts Admin who was a, a really amazing help throughout the whole project. And I'd also like to thank the wonderful people in this room who have donated objects to the My Home is My Museum collection. I haven't met all of you so um, <laughs> some of you I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if they donated something. <laughs> Who was it and what did they donate? Can I match the person to the object? And some of you I know really well. So um, it, it's lovely and, and you've really made the project. So what is My Home is My Museum? I'm just going to stand up so I've got a few images to present to here. Um, my Home is My Museum was a, a collection of different things. It manifests through um, some performances that took place inside some Cambridge houses. The online collection, um, which is a, a group of objects that people have donated that are on, online through the Curating Cambridge website. A discussion, which is why we're here today and lovely to see you all. A publication, and I hope all of you on your seats have found a little booklet that create, um, contains three texts written by the wonderful speakers who are here today, Lottie Yule Peterson from Wising Arts Centre, where she is curator, and Rachel Hurdley, who is the research fellow at Cardiff University in the Department of Social Scientists. And they have both written a piece in this booklet alongside uh, a piece I've written myself as a reflection on the project. And the final part of My Home is My Museum is an exhibition which we've just been lucky enough to be taken round in the galleries here at the um, Museum of Cambridge. So the first part of My Home is My Museum was this question that I had about what are, what are the things that we hold dear, that we cherish? What are the things that we keep and that we display in our homes? And why is it that we have those things around us? What do they say about us? What do they say about the way we present ourselves? And the online collection is a group of different wonderful objects, all donated for different reasons. And if you go onto the website at curatingcambridge.org.uk under the My Home is My Museum project, you'll see a wonderful mix of objects from the ashes of two dogs to a lovely tea caddy to a vase teapot, teacup, I'm not sure what the technical term is for that, it's a sort of teapot, teacup in one, and many, many more things, some of which have historical value, some have emotional value, some have value because of the associations that they bring, and some are about memories and surrounding ourselves with the memories of different things. And objects 
that were donated by people all across Cambridge and around. The criteria was that you had to have a CB postcode. So as well, these objects that have been donated say something about us as Cambridge people, as people from this area. Um, some objects had incredible, intense family significance. This is a, an object that was um, treasured by a child. And as he grew up, you know, child, children have comforters. This was what's left of what was a much larger comforter. So that has a lot of, um, very much a family significance to it. And this large lump of chalk was found on a beach in Normandy. Um, and it's, it's, when you see on the website, you'll notice there's a photograph of the object and the object in its context. And when I first saw this, I thought it was quite small because I didn't go and photograph this object. But actually, it's quite sizable. Um, and apparently, a particular type of chalk that's found in a, s a particular part of Normandy in France. Um, this particular object, again, an object that's reminiscent of both a, m a memory but also a, a particular occasion, an event in a sort of family history. It's a, a rally plate that's travelled on the front of a, a mini car all the way up the Acropolis in Greece. Um, so that's, that's certainly something that is significant in terms of achievement, but also significant for, I suppose, positioning a piece of family history with a date and a place and a time. And this, this object really fascinated me because this was an object that was made by some members of a family. And when they talked about it, they talked about the fact that it had, was now displayed because it sort of had just been there all that time. And it had just found its way into being part of their family history and display, not because it had been specifically positioned there as a significant moment in time, but just it had acquired that status over a period of time. So the objects in the collection are really far, far ranging, broad in, in what they are, but broad in the reasons that they've been donated. Part of the project also uh, were a series of performances that were in um, some Cambridge households. Um, by their nature, they were available only to a small number of people because there were only eight places in the audience for each performance <coughs> because obviously it was in a, in a domestic setting. And I took the part of the tour guide and took people around the houses looking at the objects of significance that the owners of the houses had told me about. And crafting those performances were, was an interesting process. I felt very responsible in presenting objects in the right way. Um, was I able to reveal certain things that the owner had told me about their objects? Um, was I able to add more information to those objects that I then went on to research? And it was, it was also interesting because that responsibility brought with it quite a precariousness for me a as a performer in a very close environment with my audience, talking about things that were very precious to somebody, it felt, I felt very honoured and very privileged, but also uh, um, that it was a vulnerable position because you were a conduit for, I suppose, transferring the meaning of those things to people who were complete strangers. Some of the performance was a little bit humorous, and uh, this particular house that the performance took place in didn't have a mantelpiece. So we created um, an imaginary mantelpiece by labelling things that might have been on the mantelpiece at particular times during the, the, um, the house's history. And a lot of the script for the performance and what I said was very much taken, almost directly in some occasions, from what the householders had told me. So where they had said that there was an object on their mantelpiece that they were really interested in and gave me lots of history, I tried to continue that. Where there was an object on the mantelpiece that they didn't really know anything about, then perhaps I just drew attention to it and put it down. So 
trying, I guess, to think about the way that we all have things that we keep and treasure that we know a lot about. And some things are important, but we don't know very much about them at all. Um, but they nevertheless have a place in our lives. There was a wonderful penguin. You might have spotted it on the previous slide there, or a pair of penguins in that glass paperweight. And part of the performance was mu very much crafted around the life of a penguin, the history of penguins, the number of different species of penguins, and the fact that um, parents of baby penguins have to feed them regularly, both mother and father. And so um, we had some ice cubes that we fed to the audience through the performance. <laughs> And I was also thinking during the performance about, you know, what, what makes a museum and what makes a home and where is the crossover? Do we curate our houses as museums? Do we really think about where we position things? Or is it, does it happen randomly? Does it just grow over time as we, as we gather bits and bobs on our shelves? And what happens if we start to bring in museum paraphernalia or museum equipment or museum uniform into a domestic setting? If we cordon areas off, does that make them more special? Does it make them untouchable? What does, what does that do to our perception of home? So we used in one of the houses this, this barrier rope to um, divide part of the room. I just wanted to... Um, before I introduce our other lovely speakers, I just also wanted to say that um, my home is my museum has become so much more than I ever thought it could be. The fact that everybody's here is part of that. Um, and that I hope eventually that the collection will grow and continue on and that this is only a pause point in the project because I think it would be amazing to actually grow it maybe to other cities and maybe even nationally. So we had a a very large online collection and then we perhaps could have the, the Cambridge one as, a, as the inaugural one. But um, I'm going to now hand over to Rachel who's going to talk a little bit about her research and the way that she has approached things in people's houses. Okay, thanks Caroline. Yeah, thanks. I need to break it. So, um, bef hello everyone. Um, thanks, Caroline, for inviting me to be part of this project because it's so exciting um, to, to be part of something that's um, in the real world. <laughs> um, and that quote, uh, it's a shrine, isn't it? Um, I probably heard dozens of times while I was um, doing a long-term study of mantelpieces, domestic mantelpieces, and what people displayed on their mantelpieces. And I thought, well, that would have been a really short book, and I needn't have done any work whatsoever. But just people take it for granted that that is what a mantelpiece is. It's a shrine, isn't it? But without thinking past that, a shrine to what? How is it a shrine? And the reason that I use this photo uh, with that quote is because um, one of the uh, women in the study sent me in this, well, this is my mantelpiece, and look at it. I have sepia tinted it, obviously, to give it more of that sort of atmosphere of oldiness. There are silver, everything's silver on it, and it has that look of something that's always been there. So I went into her house, and uh, I walked in through the, the uh, sitting room door and there was the sofa where I was invited to sit and behind the sofa was that shelf um, which cost about £2.49 from B&Q and so she had three sons who would all sit like this on the sofa looking at the telly because the telly was over there um, and the man her mantel shelf was behind them, but it's something she'd always wanted and that she'd consciously created with this little pine shelf from B&Q. And she had made this little shrine. And for her, she deliberately wanted this theme of silver. And what was so interesting about this little shrine was actually most of the objects on there were taken from her husband's family. 
who are from India. And so she'd, she'd very consciously curated this shrine to family and to memory, um, much of which actually didn't belong to her, but in kind of making this little mantel shelf, she, she made it, if you see what I mean. She created it. And the thinking about this idea of curating, you know, curating obviously comes from um, the Latin verb to care and thinking about those the, the slight change of meaning between caring for and caring about. And studying mantelpieces, the, the way in which people care for, about themselves through telling their own life stories or creating life stories uh, for other people, for members of the family, friends and so on, and caring for or about things. And how sometimes, actually, caring for others rather than themselves. Um, and you'll see that in the photos that I'm going to show you. And mantelpieces, people often think of them as being symmetrical. You know, that the stereotypical mantelpiece of the clock with the vases and the candlesticks at the end. But actually, it's quite an awkward balancing act. It's always in pr a process of negotiation. He's caring for about things oneself, others, and how to keep that going. Um, and so this first photo I wanted to, to show you um, about how things change over time. Um, and so the, the woman at the top, I'd asked, I asked everyone um, who took part in the study to draw their mantelpieces and send them in. But by the time I got to their houses, of course, things change. And I was interested in the way in which the photo at the top, a lot of things are being taken away. And thinking about curation, um, this woman who was in her 70s, her daughter had come along and said, well, mum, that's wrong. That's wrong for, a pe for the period of this house. And she was obsessed with periods, the propriety of you know, period houses and everything being just right. So she'd whisked everything off the mantelpiece and left her poor mother with just the mirror and the clock saying, there you go, mother, with this, this bare mantelpiece. And the second photo, the woman, um, Rosanna, had, had drawn me her, mantel, uh, her mantelpiece was her windowsill, if you can see, absolute nothing on it, nothing at all. But by the time I got to the house, uh, she showed me the top of the gas fire, which is one of those living flame gas fires. And she had these two little Chinese figurines on. And this was a rented house. She moved around a lot for her husband's job. And those Chinese figurines told a story of how she cared for herself with these multiple moves. She was often quite lonely. It was difficult to make friends. And she was in this brand new rented house. And she objected to the narrowness of the top of that fire. It was about that thick. So it had been designed in such a way that no one was going to put anything on, on this. And uh, she went out and she found these Chinese figurines, specifically because their bottoms were about an inch thick, and sat them on there. But the way in which she told the story of the figurines... Um, in, in telling that story, she told a story about herself because she talked about how sad they looked. And so she'd taken ownership of, of this rented house and in doing so, it also enabled her to tell the story of, of how she felt with these multiple moves. So, um, again, this was someone, as you know, in the 70s, um, there was a bit of a craze for ripping out, let's all get central heating, rip everything out. And so this was a house which had the gas fire and then had these um, wooden shells, you know, the sort that spread right along on either side. And this woman had been made the repository of um, her daughter's teapot collection. Um, because her daughter had been collecting teapots and then thought, I don't want to collect teapots anymore. I know, mum will have them. And this was quite a common theme. Thinking about how museums often get... Um, I, w 
well, I hesitate to use the word dance, but I know Rebecca talked about the fact that only 10% of this museum's objects are on display, so much is, is in storage. But the way in which mothers became repositories of things in this strange sort of reverse inheritance when their children <coughs> tired of various collections but didn't quite want to pass them on to um, jumble sales or second-hand shops. And the reason that this is called Judith's China Dog is because the, I asked her what she would take in the event of a fire. And out of all this vast collection, she selected a small dog that her daughter had bought for her on a school trip. Um, can you see the dog? Yes? Has everyone seen the dog? That, that black one there? Yes. So it's the thing about the weight of stuff that's in so many houses and how difficult it is for people to dispose of things in what's called the moral economy because it's not just about stuff. They're so laden with uh, relations with members of the family, with um, wider social relations. So there was actually one thing in that whole collection that she would keep and everything else, in a sense, she was keeping for her daughter. And uh, here is uh, another case where, um, you know, sometimes gifts can be very difficult. Who has presents on display that they would not have chosen for themselves? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Who, can, can I just ask, uh, has anyone ever had, has ever an accident happened to any of those things that couldn't, have those things ever got broken? No, they got the idea. Yes. <laughs> I was once given an enormous wooden pig by an ex-boyfriend, and then I got a puppy that chewed a lot. It's <laughs> a terrible shame. Um, and what, were, what was interesting about this woman was, um, was that idea about the weight of inheritance. You know, um, there were gifts, which are awkward, but inheritance objects and that idea of caring for the family history through the th things, because it's frequently through things that how else do you remember unless they're written down or through things or, you know, through telling stories. Um, and things are important for kind of keeping that memory present and those absent presences. This woman's grandmother died. She hated her grandmother. And I'm just going to tell a little story. So... This is what Nikki said. The mice, can you see them? You can just see the tails. Slightly to the right, you see the round photo, and there's, you can just see the tail of, of a mouse. Um, yes? No? Okay, you take my word. Oh, God, I could be making it up. And she said, the mice are from my father's mother. That's the one thing of hers I have because I wouldn't have anything else of hers in the house. I hated her. <laughs> she was frightfully snobby and was very sexist. She was a witch. From the age of 12 onwards, I refused to see her after that. I didn't see her until she died. I allowed the mice house space on the, I think it was William Morris, Nothing that isn't useful or that you believe to be beautiful. I believe them to be beautiful. They have no sentimental value whatsoever than they've been in all the flats George and I have lived in, and I like them. <laughs> <laughs> and so th that was the amount of room she permitted her grandmother in the sense of remembering her grandmother. That was the amount of space she allowed them. And it was interesting that... Uh, she then went on to say they weren't just beautiful, they were useful because they were good for entertaining bored children, presumably playing with the cat down there, so games of, of, of cat and mice. And if you think about how many people you go into their houses and they're surrounded, laden down with family history, um, but she'd freed herself of that and just kept those two tiny things. Um, and actually... Uh, she then led me to her kitchen windowsill where she kept all her cooking books um, and she said, this really is my mantelpiece actually. It's, it's because 
it's about doing, it's about being with family and friends and part of everyday life rather than a shelf where these things go on display. And I just wanted to get back to that idea of the shrine and I don't know how many of you think about your mantelpiece space but a lot of people I spoke with said nothing happens it's just always the same so I asked them to take photographs monthly photographs over the course of a year to come up with these calendars and um, I gave them those disposable cameras I love those disposable cameras because you can't take hundreds of photos and you don't see them till they've been developed and this couple were really surprised that actually over the course of a year so much had happened that was celebrated on the mantelpiece in terms of um, social rituals, family rights and um, relations in process. This is what happens. This is the everyday life of the mantelpiece. There was a wedding and a new baby. Uh, I think there was another new baby. There was a grandchild's third birthday and there was Christmas. And so that shows how mantelpieces aren't just about family, the kind of small family, but how in what we put on display makes us part of this wider world of social ritual and belonging. And actually, then it's interesting to think about what happens if you don't belong in those um, calendars of social belonging. Um, and yeah, just looking at how many people have got a, a clock on prominent display still, despite Phones, watches, yes, yeah, some hands, some hands, yeah. Um, and so there's one carriage clock there, there are two more in the attic, and they were all wedding presents. Um, and so these people, they've been married by this point, they've now been married about 20 years, but at the time they've been married quite a long time, and they couldn't get rid of the clocks in the attic. And it's that thought of being haunted by things that follow you around everywhere from house to house because you can't get rid of them because they are so bound up in what is socially expected. You don't just give wedding presents to the nearest church jumble sale. You have to carry them about on your back, almost like snails. Um, and just thinking in the wider sense of, you know, we've just been walking around a museum where we've been gazing at objects um, and they are a spectacle for us. And this is a case in which uh, the woman had been married unhappily, got divorced and got together with a female partner. Um, and her family, her parents were not too happy about this and she felt that despite the picture of her and her um, long-term female partner on display, she still had to keep out all the Edinburgh crystal mm -hmm. and the china that her family had given to her for her wedding. So that notion of how much of what we put on display is for other people, almost at the expense of our own feelings. So, just wanted to bring in some sort of mass consumption here. So thinking about collections, this is um, a woman's collection of pool pottery. And thinking about negotiations, um, her husband was not at all happy with the pool pottery being on display in their house where they had three small children, including two boys who liked playing football inside. <laughs> um, but there was no way that she was going to allow his disgusting sports trophies to be on her mantelpiece so they lived up in the attic and she had won the battle for the time being but what was interesting was the way in which she saw them as things of beauty to have on display otherwise what's the point um, her husband was an accountant and thought precious things should be kept in the attic in storage and not shown um, and his um, symbols of achievement his sports trophies actually belonged in public um, and just looking at those two collections, those are, again, B&Q, go and buy your mantelpiece and go and put whatever collection you want to on top of them for your own little China or sports trophy museum. And just really to end with a question, it's a shrine, isn't it? If so, what's it a shrine to? And this is interesting because 
I don't, I, do you look in people's front windows when you're walking past on the street and just pray they keep their curtains open because you can have a really good nose? Yeah. And the, yeah, the number of people now who have flat screen tellies above their mantelpieces, have you seen? Do you not look in people's windows? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do? So you're shaking your head. I was like, oh, no. Yeah. And can't see in mine. Oh, well. Um, and of course, if you lived in, in the Netherlands, there's a culture there of not having curtains. They think we're very peculiar. So, um, in a house right by the road. Yeah. And the, the curtains were always open. Not that they were open. No. And anybody could see in front of me. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they could see. So what's in that scene if it's worth going inside? Though apparently, house, house burglaries are going down now. They're going more for the smartphones. So. Just a, <laughs> a crumb of comfort. <laughs> but, yeah, you see the flat screen flickering above the, the mantelpiece, still with the sort of ornaments on display and how things are changing in, in the household. And this was interesting because the flat screen went up onto a bare wall in a converted barn, but the owner felt there was something missing and so built this shelf to go underneath it. But what you'll notice is it's still got the clock digital clock and then it's got the DVDs and the probably Xbox and all that sort of stuff and so how uh, you know what what do we put on display and what, what do we think is appropriate to put on display or to store and keep behind so that's it thank you um, I'm not sure how to get yours up Lottie okay <laughs> So I'd like now to um, introduce Lotta Yule peterson who's curator at Wising Arts Centre. She's going to mm? talk about um, yeah, okay. artists working okay. in the domestic setting. Yeah. Are you okay? Okay, maybe yeah. I can just start. Yeah, you start. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks a lot, uh, Caroline, for inviting me to come in. Thank you. Um, and um, we're with another perspective, I guess the reason why Caroline also invited me is that Caroline and I, we share a wall <laughs> at Wising Arts Centre, not only a wall, and we do tend to come in and out and have discussions about what you're doing and what I'm doing, basically, because I sit in the office and you have a studio at Wising. So one day we were starting talking about, I was coming back from a maternity leave, so uh, I was catching up with you, Caroline, about what you were planning, and it was very much the initial thinking of uh, of your project, My Home is My Museum. Uh, and then I was also thinking about an exhibition, actually, very much coming from perhaps a, that maternity leave kind of gives you a sabbatical leave, and but it also gives you a thinking space. And it was uh, in a very domestic setting. <laughs> Um, being on return to leave. Um, so I thought to introduce you as well to kind of what I was thinking at that time. Uh, I was thinking very much about uh, the French philosopher Gaston Bachelard. He uh, has written a lot about poetics of space where he writes, uh, I quote from him, if I was asked to name a chief benefit of the house, I should say the house shelters daydreaming of the house, the house protects the dreamer, the house allows one to dream in peace. So it was very much of that dreaming situation I found myself in before coming back, and I knew I had to do an exhibition at Wising Arts Centre. Um, so coming coming into kind of reality, I started to think about this exhibition, um, and we invited an artist called Jaius Round to think with me about an exhibition in our 17th century farmhouse, because Wising is a place having studios, for Caroline and other artists, but also a project space, a gallery space, loads of ground actually, 11 acres of land. But on top of that, we have uh, a 17th century house, so we do actually have a physical house. So I was quite keen not to do a show about the theme of the domestic, but I wanted to do a show actually in the house with artists who uh, came on residency. So it was part of, it was part of actually our anniversary program, we turned 25 this year. Uh, so we invited loads of artists back who kind of reflected in a subtle way about domestic interest in their work, but also wanted to respond on the house. Um, 
the title of the show, uh, sorry, it's a bit small here, uh, is The Influence of Furniture on Love. And that's uh, indirectly a quote uh, to a very famous uh, scholar and fellow, an economist called John Maynard Keynes. Uh, many of you probably know of him. But uh, in our research, Giles um, and I talked a lot about love uh, for the house, not in a personal way or to each other, <laughs> um, but a lot about love and what that actually impacts, both in terms of curating, but also as a theme for artists to think about love, dreaming and a house. Um, and in his research as an artist, he remember he uh, discovered a title in a book of an unpublished essay that Keynes did uh, write. We're not really sure, Cambridge University are not really sure when he wrote it actually. But the whole um, uh, essay is quite long. Uh, is can we consume our surplus or the influence of furniture and love? And we were privileged to get the copyright uh, for, this sh uh, for the title of the show. Um, and if you're very keen, it's a handwritten es essay unpublished. <coughs> if you're very keen to look in to that essay, you can go to uh, King's College Archive and ask for permission to read it. It was quite overwhelming for me to turn up at King's College and then get a handwritten, uh, obviously a copy, <laughs> uh, not the original one, but a handwritten copy of Keynes uh, because it kind of immediately went back to me thinking about love and empathy and the uh, kind of a personal approach to curating a show with Giles Round. Um, so um, the farmhouse is quite a spectacular kind of feature. Some of you have been in the house, not all of you obviously, but I can tell you it's a 17th century farmhouse and the story goes that all of the beans have been collected or bought up by uh, beans or wood from the uh, Spanish Armada. So it's quite dramatic, curved. And it, what's also nice about the house is that it feels quite attached to uh, the Museum of Cambridge, but also to Kettle's Yard in a way, that personal space where artists, they come and live and work. So we asked all of the artists to respond and also ask artists to um, display pre-existing works. So um, two artists that you see here, uh, this is a, an image of a notice board by the Grantchester Pottery because we felt that it was good for the kitchen area. Now I you're in the kitchen area <laughs> to have a notice board, it's very useful. There used to be a notice board, but a horrible, uh, ocky one. So this show actually, in the intention <coughs> with this show was also to clean up a house, basically. Like the curating and working with the artists obviously is really has was really important, but I have to say the deep clean was equally important. We were cleaning like mad housewives, actually scraping the floor, removing all of these yucky carpets and sanding floors, painting, uh, painting the floors, like everything was so kind of about deep cleaning actually. So I would say like the care and love was very much a dirty job. <laughs> as, and as you can see, one of the signs here um, next to the notice board by Grantchester Pottery is a sign by Laura Provost. She has four different signs throughout the house. Uh, and Laura Provost has written this sign for the kitchen, ideally this room would be loved and cared for. <laughs> and we thought that was kind of a good introduction to the show as well. As you, in many museums, you have all of these dis displays and information, but not, not doing it from a kind of institutional uh, approach. We felt that it was quite appropriate, appropriate that an artist would make uh, a sign as a kind of introduction to the show. Um, and what we also tried to do was to kind of blur the boundaries between object and art. So this is uh, some also some ceramic kitchenware by the Grantchester Pottery. Um, and that was kind of an interesting um, object to have because they're di displayed there quite kind of in a particular way. And we had to constantly to redirect, like, re like, uh, reinstall them every day because they kept moving around because the visitors moving them and also because we encouraged them to use them basically which was a bit overwhelming you had to say it in a quite detective way that actually these art objects you can use them because they were really blurring the boundaries of in between what is the art and what's the object this is an object <laughs> but it's specifically chosen by Giles Round the co-curator of the show as a um, basically as a honor of this designer. So 
that was where people were making espresso from this um, espresso maker um, uh, machine. Um, going in from the kitchen area into the front room, we rearranged the front room as well because it was a very dark space. So the whole point was about kind of make air things up and make things much clearer. Uh, so we installed a new lighting system. We had this piece in the middle by Gil Leung, uh, who's very into the ideas of language and interior design. The TV monitor was on the floor, so that really kind of changed people's perception of coming into a front room. There's not a screen in front of you, you have to go there. Um, a very a beautiful classical um, uh, looping um, soundtrack um, and interior of a very modernistic, actually, living room you saw on the screen. So quite a kind of contradiction uh, within that work. Um, we set up a library, so Giles Round, who is the co-curator of the show, he made specific shelves uh, indirectly also to honor specific designers. So again, that's an artwork, but it's also a very functional piece for these books that is a kind of ev ever-growing uh, library um, where we are asking everyone who comes to this house to basically donate a book in that they care for. And within the book, there is a specific book plate. So you donated a book, Caroline, and many others who actually come via Rising donated a book. So it's, it's a kind of initial approach. We even changed the contract of residency artists that they should donate a book uh, for the library. <laughs> so kind of that they think about the space that they inhabit. That was basically what we wanted to do. Um, we now have a piano in the house as well. We really tried right, to improve like, the house and kind of the condition of living because um, a house, especially this house, but uh, many other houses, I think it's really important for artists to produce works. Even though it's a private space, many artists use a house as a site of production. So it's quite interesting to think about that, that perhaps in the future there will be performance in the house because we have now this piano. Uh, there was a live performance by Kelly Spooner where a singer pianist was commissioned to sit and sing um, songs that she had rewritten, um, Tina Turner songs, for example, what, what does love had got to do with it, with words of labor. He was sitting, being paid throughout the <laughs> um, opening to uh, sing all of these songs related to labor. Um, it's funny, like all of these images, there are no people there, <laughs> but uh, objects. Um, so this this uh, little light shade you see here, here as well is by Grantchester Pottery as well, and you can just see it from here. That's basically the old main entrance to the house, and you can go straight out to the garden from here. This uh, light shade is called Pothead, <laughs> and it's a ceramic piece. Um, in a, one of the bedrooms, we commissioned a, an artist, Ruth Beale, who actually was also involved in this library piece that you saw from the front room. We basically wanted to ask her to do a, a wallpaper specifically for one of the rooms, and she was very much inspired by the liberty of press and working class libraries. So she's done loads of research in a, in a, in a library called uh, the Working Class Library up in Salford, where it's a private uh, library, but open to the public. So she, um, she did a, a, a kind of one-off print, a special uh, wallpaper that still, many of these works are still part of the house, so it's also part of thinking long term. Um, she uh, also had a framed piece up there, you can't really see it, but it's a piece um, of the two people behind the library, uh, of the, the couple uh, fro, uh, and they had over 15,000 books about the working class movement. So it's a quite substantial bit, but set in their private home. So she wanted to kind of bring that research into the house of, of Weising. Um, these are some ceramic works by Ben Briley, who is a ceramicist and came to Weising and established a very, very kind of particular kiln actually called the Anima Gamma Kiln. So we wanted to bring in um, also people working more in a more object-minded way. Um, a lot of people have been really puzzled about these objects or sculptures because they do look a bit like, a, like stones. Um, uh, another piece which was quite difficult for people to hear necessarily, it only played one time during the opening times, but it's a piece by Julia Blightman called Sailing By. 
and that piece is directly uh, a, pie uh, a piece that uh, plays off the, the quite famous uh, song Call Sailing By at the time where, uh, just before the shipping forecast. So again, it's, it's a piece which is really blurring as well, kind of the everyday, because it's basically a radio uh, mimicking what you normally could hear at home um, with a cop, a copy cop next to it. Um, here's some special um, wallpaper by the Grandchester Pottery um, and loads of other works that I don't want to go into details with. But there's this piece, which is a letterhead press by Giles Round, which was actually the flyer of the show. So we wanted to think about the flyer, the marketing that you have in connection to a show a bit more long term. So this is without all of the information, who's in the show and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it has a letterhead saying Wising Grand Farmhouse. So we wanted to also think about long term or stationary for the, um, um, for the farmhouse. So you can, a bit going back to that quote of uh, Gaston Bachelard, to sit and dream when you come on residency and basically write your dreams down on this uh, farmhouse stationery. More wallpapers. These are some uh, wallpaper of endless supply. This is kind of going upstairs. Uh, these uh, towels down here is a piece by Florian Rosmar and he specially fluffed, he has a very kind of particular technique. He loves to care for material and towels, um, but he specially fluffed the, <laughs> the, the towels from the farmhouse. <laughs> they needed a lot of attention and care, I have to say. Uh, so we're very happy he did that and rearranged them um, and in a very particular way with some concrete brackets around them. They look completely perfect and neat. Uh, we really needed someone who could kind of do that job. <laughs> um, then there's this piece of Elizabeth Price, uh, a very particular and kind of sh uh, striking piece. Um, we wanted it to be quite striking, actually. So there's nothing in that room, that massive uh, room upstairs, bedroom. The only thing you would discover is this chest of drawer, and on the chest of drawer there is a gun, uh, it's fixed to the chest of drawer, <laughs> to say. Uh, so we, we had uh, a, f a few kind of discussion about this, the gun, obviously. <laughs> but um, um, what it we wanted to do was that you would actually discover it. You couldn't w immediately see it when you come into the living room and you, you would be faced by this quite striking um, object or furniture. Uh, another piece which um, is by Philemon Piraki, she actually came in and took photos of that wall at specific times and came back, repainted um, the wall with the, p with the, the colours uh, that she discovered in these digital photos that she took. So that it's basically a white wall, that's the title of the work. <laughs> Obviously you can see the outcome is quite different because of the daylight and then the, the transformation from a photos uh, from the digital photo to the actual paint. Um, in the house, we also made some new curtains. It's quite expensive to make curtains from scratch, I have to say, with the design and the print and uh, of fabric and the making. But we made some curtains by Grantchester Pottery as well. Um, and we showed this very particular pine, uh, pine, uh, pineapple cast uh, by an artist called Luca Fai which was a very kind of intriguing object. It was stand freestanding uh, on shelves of Giants Round as well, the same principles of the library, basically, and the shelves still in the house. Uh, a prototype of a bed. I'm just going to flick through it because you know, I'm running a bit behind. Outside um, in the garden, um, as you can see, it is an old house. Um, and has a lot of features and stories. Um, and that was basically what we wanted to do, like to make an, an exhibition that would highlight uh, the love and care for this house and really think about the future of how this house could be used. Um, there's a private garden, uh, and th these are uh, some brackets uh, made by Florian Rosmar, the same artist who had rearranged the towels in such a particular way. He reflected on his time at Weising in the sense that he discovered at some point a mushroom <laughs> in the garden um, falling down from the tree. You, you, know, the, you see these massive mushrooms sometimes in a tree which is, can look very fresh, but at that time he, when he saw it, it was nearly kind of decaying. 
and he wanted to kind of maybe put, put a bit more emphasis that this could potentially stay a bit longer, so he made these concrete uh, brackets that are really kind of somehow almost feels like they're su being supported by the tree, but they're also supporting the tree that they're kind of there. And it, um, what, what we just uh, kind of love with that piece was that it was the only piece in the garden, so you would uh, kind of, it was there for a very particular reason because of his um, experience with the garden um, and kind of uh, thinking back on the past of, of how he experienced that mushroom. That's the end. So yeah, instead of doing a show in a uh, kind of a straightforward show, we kind of wanted to, to kind of bri bring it into a private space uh, and a house that is not really owned by anyone, but has that, it's kind of in between between a private home and a public space in a way. Um, so, yep. <laughs>